My guest today is a man who created a character called El Muerto, which ended up becoming a movie in 2007 with the lead played by Wilder Valderrama from that 70s show. And he's one of the few creators in the world that, you know, his IP got turned into a movie and he still owns all the rights to his character, which is an extremely rare thing today. Without further ado, cartoonist, artist, Javier Hernandez. Thanks for having me, Ruben. Yeah, finally connected. It's all good. Um, I'm doing good. It's, you know, the heat. Can't take the heat like I used to in the olden days, but um, just getting through it. Awesome. So, Javier, let's take it back, way, way back to the beginning. Uh, how did you get into comics? Yeah, I think like a lot of people, uh, when I was a kid, I don't know, probably about eight, eight or nine, seven, eight or nine, my older brother, um, older brother Albert, he gave me, a, I don't know, two bags of comics. He used to collect comics. The comics that he bought was Marvel DC, like around 1970, 71. So right as Kirby was leaving, you know, Fantastic Four, Ditko was long gone. But, you know, you still had out great stuff. John Buscema, Gene Colan, John Romita. So he gives me this comment. I guess he was just done collecting. I guess he just collected for like two years or something. Um, but, yeah, so I'm looking through these comics. Like he did have some Kirby Fantastic Fours. Uh, he had some Neil Adams Batman. Uh, I forgot. It's issue 400 of Batman or Detective with Man Bat and Batman standing over the city like oh my god so right off the top i was just seeing all these fantastic artists all very different gene colin john romita gil kane kirby um and and then um uh not Strankle, neil adams at dc um and he had some ditko like uh, those marvel tales reprints at the time so i, I got to see like oh okay the, ditko and i fell in love with ditko's work ever since but so right off the top, I just got this crazy exposure to this weird 1970-71 era Marvel. <laughs> um, so after I reread those books over and over, you know they were mine now. He gave them to me. So it's like, well, let's go see what's what's brand new. So I go over to the local 7-Eleven. Um, so I, this was probably about 1975 when I got his comics. One of the first X Men I got was I think. I want to see one, you'll know, you'll know this better, you're, this is your thing, but number, I think 111, where the X-Men are being held captive in a freak show circus, and that's the first time I ever saw X-Men, it's like, wow, they're circus freaks, because they're, you know, they're naturally, whatever you want to call it, they're kind of monstrous, some of them, Nightcrawler, Colossus, the, the feral Wolverine, so anyway, that was my first exposure to X-Men, as far as new X-Men, so I think Giant Size would probably come out by then, obviously. Um, but yeah, and then, so I just started buying brand new comics every week or whenever I had allowance money. So I was buying 25 cent comics. Um, so that was my start. My brother and then me buying 25 cent Bronze Age. Yeah, I, I absolutely adore that era of comic books. You and me have that in common with the early Marvel. And like, those are my favorite things to find in collections. Like when we've bought collections, I don't think I really mentioned that on this podcast, but I have a comic book store as well. So like anytime we, we buy collections, like that is like the, that's like finding gold for me, you know, like when you're panning and uh, anytime we find a, a early Marvel and DC like that, ooh, that's, that's the cream of the crop for me. That, there's something about, and you can contest to this. There, there's something about the, the, the paper quality, right? It's almost like it's like the way it's printed. It's almost like it's screen printed or something on there. Like some of those colors pop more than some things that are out modern now. And it's, it's I don't know what it is. Like it, it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful sight to see. Like, and just the art, you know, and I'm also a big fan of, of Kirby and Ditko. And so we have a lot of that stuff in common. So that's why you notice I'm always like stoked on when you post things like because I genuinely am a fan too, you know. So what well, I trip out on uh, all you comic retailer friends of mine because yeah, you guys are running a business, you know, you got to do business and you got to buy stuff and sell and stuff. But yeah, I'm sure when you're looking through the stuff, you're also the fan of the of those comics too. So you got to decide which do I keep, which do I sell, or whatever. So I've learned to to just like let go, you know. Like everything that we get, we'll usually sell. But every now and then, 
I may keep like one gem that's in there, you know, because it's something that I was genuinely looking for. And so every now and then, if it's like in the, the grade good enough, because uh, I've really narrowed down my collection to like a few key pieces. But, you know, I like to think of it like as a souvenir sometimes. Like you get this epic, because uh, like one time uh, we bought a large collection in Los Angeles. And uh, this was this was actually right before the pandemic. And it was probably like, I want to say this is this is legitimately what it was like 50 long boxes it was a lot yeah and I kept one comic from all of that I, I love that era of the comics and uh funny enough we're at the giant size x-men could you imagine uh since you were in that could you imagine like seeing a stack of those because you know what they go for now but like seeing a stack of those fresh on the newsstand like I would have got my uh, Slurpee stains on it, or you know, I, I was I go to the Seven Eleven on my bike, and I think Mom would give me two bucks so I can buy like I don't know four or five comics and like a the Slurpee. And back then they had those Marvel superhero cups. But I think there's something about being like a ten year old, like whatever it is you get into the first time, whether it's baseball or you know wrestling, whatever bicycles. I mean, there's something about being that age because you're still a kid, and there's still that wide eyed innocence. But then you're starting to develop like, oh, you know what? I got a little bit of money now. I can like actually pick what I want instead of just having mom and dad or someone give it to me. So you start slowly developing like your own interest and taste and, you know, what you want. And as, as, if you have the money for it at the time. So it's kind of interesting about that. It's kind of one of the first times where like you as a human being get to make like your decisions. Yeah, you know, you're, you're choosing. It's like it's like you're independent, you know, for the first time, even as a youth. So it's pretty cool. I mean, there's something about that. There's something about the spinner rack. I hope, I hope people have experienced it because you're turning it. So you're getting like this row of comics and then you're and then the next row is coming up. And then you're just like trying to look, oh, I want this one. Let me check. I mean, and there's so many to choose from. Um. That's when it gets down to like, well, Gil Kane kicked ass on cover art, so I think I'd always pick up a Gil Kane at least the cover, see what the book was was like. But yeah, it's a magic, it's a wonderful era of discovery as a as a kid. El Muerto, your creation, fantastic, absolutely love it. I told you I've been a fan. Was that the first character you ever created, or was there was there a, a character that predated El Muerto? Uh, yeah, El Muerto. Yeah, it's a good question now uh, because that's. Well, Mark was my professional debut in 1998. Um, but a year before that, I was working on El Muerto for like at least a year or so in between my, you know, my day job at Target, I think at the time, yeah. Um, so in, in uh, 97, a friend of mine, Raphael Navarro, he goes, hey, uh, he was working in animation. And he goes, hey, Hav, uh, some friends of mine are putting together this little comic called, it's a great title, Hot Mexican Love Comics. I know, right? Best title ever. And they asked him to contribute a story. Then he asked me if I wanted to contribute. And I thought about it. I go, oh, wow, okay, let me get something out there before I finish El Muerto. And I didn't want to do El Muerto. It's like, well, I want to, I want him to debut in his origin story. So I came up with this other character called uh, Weapon Tex-Mex. Uh, uh, big old bulky guy. He's wearing like a Zorro mask. He's got like these uh, steel adamantium, you know, horns unshaven cigar big bulky guy real ben grimm style um ben grimm or wolverine whatever um so i did a three-page story because i go well i gotta get that out done quick so yeah so that came out in 97 so that is my first professional debut if you can ever find it in your long boxes when you get a collection it's called a uh, mexican love comics it's a white cover and then there's a little square on the center that has a picture of one of the other stories in there but <laughs> So yeah, Weapon Text Mex predates El Muerto by a year. There we go, kicking some facts right there. That's really cool. I love those backstories like that. There's always something. That's why I asked that, you know. So a lot of people aren't aware of that. So then that's fun to know, you know. Um. So then, so then El Muerto comes around, and you you create that, and that's that's the one that really takes off for you. You know what I mean? That's that's that becomes like your your IP. You know, like your your bit your big property for you to the point where we'll dive into eventually but you even get a movie made of it you know so how how did that come about in creating El Muerto in general so in the 90s you know I uh like growing up in high school and such in college once I got to college I you know li living out here in LA 
back then in the 80s. Like, well, comic doesn't seem like a real profession I can achieve. You know, the Kubert School, which I'd read about, oh, that's the way in New York or New Jersey, whatever. My parents aren't going to send me there in no way. So, and, you know, not knowing not knowing too much, I just feel, okay, well, you know, maybe I won't pursue it. And then I wasn't too much, I wasn't too excited about the comic biz at that time, even though I was a fan. Because by then I was already reading about Jack Kirby and all the other artists and writers, how, you know, mistreated by the companies over the years and blah, blah, blah. So the reality sets in like, well, it's not a very nice industry in some aspects of it. Uh, the business side of it, right? We're talking about as a fan, of course, and the art, but business practice as a creator, sometimes it's not the best, I think. So it kind of didn't really uh, make me want to pursue that. Plus the avenues of trying to learn comics is, wasn't really available. So I went to college and I just took general art classes and I just got into like um, screen printing. Um, so people know just companies that print things, mostly decals is where I ended up working. Nothing fancy, just like industrial stuff, boring stuff. But I did learn how to use Adobe Illustrator and I learned about computers back then in the 80s and 90s, very important later. Um, but I always had an, you know, I always had that. And I kind of want to do comics though. I don't want to work on Spider-Man or Batman, whatever. So obviously by the 90s, self-publishing Ninja Turtles had exploded right, the year before, the decade before in the 80s. So self-publishing comics was already a well-established uh, avenue, right? A lot of people were doing it. You know what? Maybe I'll just do my own comic. Like I'll work for myself. I'll own my own work and publish it myself. So... I just started looking around at self-publishing more and meeting people at conventions and such and one or two friends I talked to about it. So uh, I decided, okay, in the mid-90s, well, I'm going to do my own comic. So what am I going to do? That's the second part. Well, I want to do something uh, culturally based. In my, in, the, in my case, Mexican-American. You know, I didn't see too much of that in the comics, although the Hernandez brothers, Jaime and Beto, were already tra trailblazing with Love and Rockets. Uh, since I forgot it's the mid eighties, late eighties, I forgot the exact debut. But, um, and then there was some heroes here and there in the mainstream, you know, Latino heroes, but then there was a few independents. I started finding, uh, Richard Dominguez that did a book called El Gato Negro. He was from Texas. This is like early nineties, mid nineties. Uh, Carlos Saldana from Los Angeles was doing a comic called Burrito. Burrito. It's a little donkey, kind of a little funny animal comic. So, I go, okay, well, now I got my game plan. I'm going to do a Latino character, and I can self-publish it. So, well, what are you going to do, though? So I just started thinking of, this is back in the mid-90s. Dia de los Muertos was, was in the communities already, but it wasn't in really in movie. I mean, there was a couple of movies, but it wasn't like in pop culture, you know, Coco style, like we have now. Or, you know, at Target, you can go to Target and buy Day of the Dead. They have the dead California lottery tickets. I mean, it's crazy. It's everywhere now. Okay, well, I'm going to do something with Day of the Dead. And then Aztec mythology was, again, something you didn't see much of in pop culture, uh, especially in the comic field. Uh, very little. Um, I know there was a, like a Dr. Fate comic, I think, that maybe Simonson, Walt Simonson drew, where he fights Ted Scott Lepoca. So it was like late 70s or something. Yeah. So, yeah, obviously, you know, people were aware of... Uh, Mexican mythology, Aztec, Mayan, and such. But, but anyway, so I go. I got to do a hero, superhero that's combining these two elements. So, somehow I just came up with this idea of like, okay, this guy's born on Day of the Dead, November second. His name's Diego de la Muerte. And what's the chance of a guy called Diego de la Muerte being born on Day of the Dead, right? Um, and he, on his way to Day of the Dead, because I go, well, he's got to get in the costume, right, the makeup and the mariachi suit. On his way to the festival, which is his birthday. He gets killed in a car accident, and he wakes up. He finds himself waking up in the land of the dead, Miklan, Aztec land of the dead. And he's confronted by the Aztec god of death, Miklan Tecutli, and then the god of destiny, Tezcatlipoca. And from there, they, you know, they rip his heart out, send him back to Earth a year later. The plan being, you know, he's supposed to be an emissary for them, for Miklan Tecutli. But, of course, Diego revolts against that. But now he's stuck on Earth with these, uh, he's got no heart. He's... He's undead. He's a zombie. He's an Aztec zombie. And he has this miraculous power to resurrect the dead. Which we haven't seen that since that book called the Bible was written thousands of years ago. <laughs> as far as I'm 
far as I know, as far as the resurrection power. So that's how I came up with El Muerto. That's why I came up with it. And that's that's why he is who he is because of these things I wanted to get out there in the comic biz at the time. My favorite thing about El Muerto is the costume. I absolutely love the mariachi costume that he has. It just pairs so great with like the face and the whole getup and everything. And I'd never seen that done before. How did you come about creating the costume and the concept for that? From day one, he was in a pretty much a mariachi outfit, black mariachi outfit. And the reason was, I mean, I love costumes. You know, I look at Spider-Man, probably considered probably the best, most creative superhero costume by most people, a lot of people. And then, you know, Batman, and there's a lot of really neat costume design. That's what comics are about, superhero comics. With El Muerto, because I knew it was going to be kind of based on Day of the Dead, uh, the theme already, so I'm thinking, okay, Mexican culture. And um, I just thought black, for sure, for the suit. But I go, you know what? Just a simple mariachi outfit. Because, um, like, the way you resonate with it. Most people can see a mariachi, and they know what it is. Like, oh, yeah, I've seen them in the restaurants, or I've seen them, whatever, playing at a festival, whatever, or just seen it. It's such an iconic Mexican uh, visual. So for me as an artist, well, that's already out there. Uh, just take it and incorporate it into your character. So it's got the short jacket, the tight pants, the little boots, the little beetle boots, as I call them. And then it's just a matter of figuring out, well, okay, but all mariachi suits, they have designs and everything on it. So I just came up with those simple stripes down the front stripes on the wrist and uh, down the leg, the side of the leg, just that simple white stripe. And that was it. And I thought, you know, it just works black and white. I mean, yeah, I could go through different color schemes, but just black with a white t-shirt. And then, then of course we get to the infamous logo, which I'm sure we'll talk about. That was the final touch. Um, and it's on his back, which is different because most superheroes, Batman and everybody, Logically, has it on the front, right? Because yeah, there you see him. With El Muerto, because this is how, this is how much thought I put into it. I, he's wearing a jacket and the white t-shirt under it. So I, I could have put the skull on the shirt. But, yes, thank you. I, that's what I thought, if I'm overthinking it. but Because, well, if the jacket moves, it could cover it, whatever. And you have that nice real estate on his back. Just that nice, big, black area of the back. All right, let's slap a nice, big, bright, white, stylized skull on the back. So that's why he has the logo on the back. Plus also, you know, big Spider-Man fan. I'm sure you guys figured this out by now. But, you know, Ditko gave Spider-Man that big, famous, red, squashed spider on his back. Um, one of the few superheroes who has the logo on his back. When you think, Yeah, when you actually go back and think, I mean, yeah, I think Superman has the S on it, but uh spidey's got that big old red spider on the back he's got the little black one on the front but so again the back of the character if you got a nice big area of color in my case black white skull so uh i'm glad i'm glad the suit resonates with you and, I'm, and i know others people like it and um again half the work was already done for me uh from mexico right the mariachis and you know just so familiar so um i'm glad i went with that design like i said it was the very first Pretty much the only idea I had for El Muerto. So sometimes your first idea, sometimes it is the best thing is just stick with it if it really, really works. Javier, in 2007, the dream came true. Your character uh, became real in the flesh and there was an El Muerto movie. And the lead was played by, uh, for those that are familiar with the show, That 70s Show, Fez's character played by Wilmer Valderrama, he would end up playing El Muerto in the movie. Let's go into that process if you want to like explain how it all came about. Just how incredible that is. I mean, because there's not very many people on this planet Earth that get their creation turned into a, a, a movie. Yeah, um, yeah, that is, yeah, it's pretty daunting to think about it that way. Um, re really quick on, on, on that note about your creation getting turned into a comic. Yeah, there's a lot of comic book movies. I mean, what, we have maybe four, five, six a year, maybe, maybe more with streaming. So there's a lot now. Now it's a whole industry. Um, and in, in the past, there was, you know, there was always superhero films as far back as the 40s, uh, serials. But um, 
how many of those are owned by the company, like the characters, right? Yeah. Like that are owned by the creator, like uh, Sin City, mm -hmm. American Splendor, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, and I'm sure there's more, but El Muerto is in that category of uh, com comic book movie made from an independent creator-owned comic. So I, I love being in that little space because it's even a smaller yeah. uh, club, whatever you want to call it, of those who have the comic uh, turned to a film. Um, <clears throat> how it came about, it wasn't something I looked for. I, I didn't, like we talked about creating the comic, I wanted to just do my own stories. I wanted to do comic books. I never thought, I wasn't planning, like, oh, I'm going, I'm going to get a movie out of this. I'm sure it was in the back of my head. I mean, I'm not dumb. Like, hey, they, you know, studios buy properties from people to make films out of. Yeah, that'd be great if it ever happened. But I was doing an interview in 2001 at uh, San Diego Comic Con, uh, uh, NPR reporter. Um, that's a great deal. I'm sure NPR stands for that still. Yeah. <laughs> and he was at the convention looking for Latino creators. In 2001, I thought that was pretty, in retrospect, that's pretty uh, yeah. uh, forward thinking on his part. I mean, because right now it's very popular. Hey, let's go find Latino creators, mm -hmm. whatever. 2001, he wanted to find out what Latino creators are doing independent work. So he came to my table and uh, he sat down, just like with you. I did an interview. Let me do an interview with him because interviews are fine. They're good. Get, get the word out there. He sat down. We talked 10 minutes and he left. Okay, thanks. Awesome. And I just figured, okay, maybe I'll remember to listen to the episode whenever it comes up in a week or two, whatever, it, whatever the schedule was. If not, that's fine too, as long as it's, it gets out there and people hear about my character on NPR because that's a different audience, which is you always want to hit different audiences too. As a as a creator, you should want to hit different audiences. Anyway, it aired. I didn't hear it because I, I, I back then it wasn't so easy to just look stuff up, I guess, online. But so it aired, and um, but friends would tell me, "Hey, I, I heard I heard you on NPR," and that was pretty cool. But one of the people that heard the interview uh, was an uh, independent filmmaker, director, uh, Brian Cox. He heard the interview and he wrote down some, you know, he wrote down my name, I guess, whatever. And then eventually they got a hold of me, his production, his staff wrote me a letter. One day I went to my P.O. box and I opened it and I had this letter. Oh, and I saw it was a production company on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. Okay, interesting. Um, the letter was like, yeah, you know, uh, our director heard your interview and he thought the character is really interesting and he's trying to find your comics. We can't find them here in Hollywood uh, at the comic shops. I guess they tried to um, Meltdown Comics right there down the block from them. Back back when there was a Meltdown Comics. Yeah. So I just told him, hey, I got two comics available. They were both photocopied black and white. And they sent me like a check for 10 bucks. Um. I should have jacked the price up, right? Oh, they're hundred dollars, but it's like <laughs> I guess I didn't know better, or I was just, you know, hey, they just want to buy the book. Okay, I'll charge them what I charge anybody else. So I got my belt, my first Hollywood check, ten bucks. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, I know. I, I should have photocopied it and put it on my wall, like the restaurants do. But anyway, so Brian read those comics, and then um, they wanted to schedule a meeting with me, and then he got busy, and then months later, you know, this is like everything I'm telling you right now drags off months. Um, so eventually I went to go meet him at his office on Sunset <clears throat> and, and his office used to be across the, used to be a Tower Records um, it's funny every time I do an interview now everything is like oh it's no longer there like oh Tower Records is gone so it's, uh, Meltdown Comics is gone Yeah, I've been around a long time folks things happen in 24 years um, had a talk with Brian he had a lot of questions um kind of like you interviewed me, but he had like questions on the character and the plot and the, you know, why is this character this and the gods did blah, blah, blah. And I'd have answers. And sometimes I go, you know what, Brian, I'm not sure. <laughs> I haven't got to that point yet, or I'm still developing that, whatever. I was just being honest with him. Um, I didn't go to Hollywood BS or school. I guess we're supposed to be all super smart and have answers for every single thing, whether they're true or not. I just, I just thought honesty is better. Yeah. Um, and I, I he appreciated that, I'm sure, because at the end of the hour, he's all, well, look, I'm curious, I was curious about turning this property into a film, if you'd be interested. And I told him, well, I wouldn't not be interested. So from that point, I got a lawyer, you know, never work without a lawyer, any type of contract, uh, particularly film, media stuff. 
Um, and then Brian had eventually got hold of a producer because Brian's a director who wanted to direct the film, but he needs a producer. Yeah, so uh, Brian co uh, contacted uh, Larry Ratner, a producer he worked with on other projects because he needs somebody to put the film together. So this is a thing where you have a lot of serendipity, I guess. Um, Larry's an independent film producer, right? So he doesn't have a big studio behind him with a limitless budget. He needs to make a movie based on the money he has. So Larry had these investors that he had met previously, uh, the Leones, uh, it was Bruno and his two sons. And they ran like this, uh, I think it was textbook publishing and music publishing business, whatever. They were always interested in the movie business. And so they got to meet a producer. Hey, we'd like to make a movie one day. Let us know if you got, you know, something works out. So Larry is sitting here like, okay, he's got the director on the one hand who wants to make the film. Then he's got these guys on the other hand who have funds that they want to invest in the film. So me, I get lucky because I have a producer who's got money access and a director who wants to make a film. So I started negotiating with Larry. I got my lawyer and the contract is bouncing back and forth between Larry and the lawyer. I would look at it and ask the lawyer to uh, translate it <laughs> to English for me, whatever. And then ask for certain things and blah, blah, blah. So the contract gets hammered out. And next thing I know, I, I got to go to Larry's office and sign it. Like, wow, it's a big step in your little yeah. independent comic book life, right? Now you're going to sign. You're, you're not signing the character away, but you're signing at least my contract. You're signing to give the producer the media rights. They can make a film, a cartoon, a video game. Pretty much anything but a comic, I guess. Anything. So I kept the comic rights. You always want to make sure you do that. I don't know. I'm sure it's been done, but I don't know too many creators would give out their comic rights. Do not give the comic rights to a producer. They make movies, okay? You keep making your comic. So that's what I did. I, you know, the whole time that they, after I signed it, till I got the rights back, I always had the right to make comics whenever I wanted to. And merchandise from my comics, which I always make stickers and buttons and whatever. So you never give out the full rights like that. I mean, you know, we talk about Ninja Turtles a lot. You know, some years ago, um, was it Peter Laird? I guess the sole owner at that point. He decided he was done at this point. And after 30, 40 years, okay, the Viacom, whoever bought it, he sold it. That's what I understand outright. Okay, you guys get everything. Publishing, everything. And I think IDW puts out the comics, but... So, but you know, he's had a lifetime of him and the uh, Eastman of enjoying the money of everything they've done for the turtles. I don't blame him. Like, okay, we're done with it or whatever. However, the story goes. Um, so anyway, uh, the movies. Okay, we got a movie deal going. So um, Brian starts working on the script. I didn't write the script. Everybody was always asking me. So no, no, I did not write the script. Brian wrote it, and then he'd always send me and Larry a draft, um, which that tells you I was very much part of the production team. I wasn't just like, oh, let me sign the deal and take off for a while, um, for a year or two. Um, I was part of the filmmaking crew, you know, the production crew, the producing team. I was an associate producer. One of the things I asked my uh, lawyer to put in, you know. Anyway, the script gets bounced around and, you know, I give comments each time I get a draft and, then, you know, um, eventually... It gets to a place where, okay, the script's done. We got a, a script here ready for a film. Um, so the first day I remember going to their office, and it's like, well, you know, we're trying, you know who's going to play him? I, I thought of Wilmer Valderrama. Again, we're talking about me growing up in the 70s. When the 70s shows, my that 70s show started, I was a huge fan. Like, oh, wow, someone made a show about the 70s. And um, I love the show. I mean, it's hilarious. And it was going on, I think it was like, two or three seasons already at that point. So, you know, at the same time, you know, thanks Hollywood. This was back in 2005, maybe 2006. Like, Oh, thanks Hollywood at the time for only having maybe two or three Latino actors to pick from. It's ridiculous. Um, it's not much better now and it's way better, but that's a whole other topic. But I thought he was perfect, right? He was this young guy. Um, Latino guy. I like that he had an accent, actually. Um, I mean, Fez has a very particular accent, but Wilmer has a, a bit of an accent, which I love. It's authentic. Um, and he's on a hit show, you know. 
the funny thing is though, like, you know, people are like Fez is playing him, but Fez is, you know, he's a silly character. I go, yeah, but that's a character. Come on. It's an actor playing a part. So for Wilmer, it was a chance for him to go, hey, I get to stretch out and do a dramatic hero role. You know, super, he was a big Spawn fan, I know. Um, so yeah, he, he, he was attracted to the dark gothic stuff too. He wouldn't, he wouldn't know from Fez. That's the beauty of actors, right? Um, so for me, I'm like tickled pink. Like, wow, we got a 70s show guy on my sh in my comic that's so much of it's influenced by my 70s <laughs> comic book culture we talked about earlier in the, in the show. Anyway, so right off the top, you're talking about a dream. Like, wow, that, that was dream casting for me. Um, and I would spend a... I, I, I worked two weeks on pre-production on the film. Again, that was in my contract. One of my things in my contract that I asked for, here's some something for everybody else out there. I want to work. I wanted to work on the movie. It's not just like, oh, don't just pay me for the rights and I just watch you guys make it. I'm lucky I live here in a LA area, so yeah, I could actually go to the filmmaking uh, sites in Hollywood and all throughout LA. So, um, but I got hired to work on the film. I got a. I asked for a weekly salary. Again, that's separate than what they pay you for the rights, and this is something I asked for. Um, so I worked two weeks pre-production, basically hanging out at the producer's office while they're hiring everybody, and people are coming in, production uh, the production team, the costume person, the makeup person. And I got to meet them all. They'd always introduce me. Oh, this is Javier, the creator. Oh, hey, what's up, guy? Oh, man, this is so great. I love comment, the guy was telling me. There was, you're like this. Um, there was this guy, Freddie Nath. He was a production artist. He comes up to me. He's like, "Oh man, this movie's perfect for me. I used to work for a Comico. Remember Comico from the, I guess, '80s? That's a that's a that's a deep cut for the comic scholars out there. Oh my god! So he was so excited. Oh, I'm working on a comic. I go, yeah, absolutely. Oh, here's another connection to comics. It's a great experience pre-production. So I I hang out at Brian's office too, the director, and he would do casting calls for the actors." And one day he goes, hey, Javier, you want to sit in on the casting? Just sit back in the back of the room and just turn on the, because I used to record their auditions. Just turn on the camera. And then, you know, when, when I say stop, just stop it. So one day this guy comes in, uh, Joel David Moore. Um, he played Diego's best friend, Zach. He's a tall, shaggy looking guy. He's like shaggy. He walks in, right? And Brian introduces him to me. Oh, uh, Joel, this is Javier, the creator of the comic. Um, and then Joel goes, Oh, wow. He's like, I just got done doing a comic book film for Daniel Klaus, Art School Confidential. And I thought, I, I go, Oh, that's awesome. Wow. T to go from Dan Klaus to me. Uh, I, I told him, I go, what I say? I go, I go, wow. So you've gone from Dan Klaus to me, El Muerto comic. He goes, yeah, maybe my next step up will be Jimmy Olsen. <laughs> I thought that was such a great little that was a cute little fun line. So it was really fun just hanging out there. And yeah, he did his audition. And yeah, they ended up picking him. Uh, obviously, he was he was really great. And there, and there was a little old lady in Art School Confidential who was our, in our film too. She's the little lady in the market where Diego steals the glasses and the clothes. And she's like, hey, get back here. I didn't realize until I saw Art School Confidential. Like, oh my God, that's the little lady. I forgot her name. But she wasn't. So we got two people. I got two people from a Dan Clouds movie in my movie. That's pretty cool. So yeah, then the movie started filming in LA and I would go, so I would go every day on the set, whether it's a six o'clock morning shoot, whatever, seven o'clock AM, eight AM. I'd get there and I'd, spend, I'd be there 12 hours and people go, what do you do? I go, I just hang out. I just hang out and watch people make my movie. You know, it's like, I'm not there to make it. I'm not the director. You know, you, you don't, you don't, you don't start interfering at that point. Um, one, at one point, Brian told me in his office, he's all, look, um, yeah, we're going to start filming, come out to the set. He's all, if you ever have any issues, with any, please just don't say it out loud. Just come up to me. and t I go, oh, my God, I would never do it out loud. Um, but I just love how he said, you come tell me what you think, what's going on. So I thought that was totally respectful. That's the respect that I think I, that I know we established in our meeting two years before in his office, the honesty. Remember I said, I was just honest. So yeah. And there'll, 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 there'll be one or I'm not going to mention the, what, what it was, but there's a couple of times and, you know, I'd go up to him after he says cut, you know, just privately. 
oh, you know, I was wondering, was it, you know, yeah, you know, whatever, whatever it was. Um, but yeah, I felt like, I felt I could do that to him uh, with him. Again, it's just that 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 great uh, camaraderie we had. So anyway, it was a it was a blessing working on that film. Um, and he, yeah, you mentioned that. So I had a cameo because again, when Brian had the script all finished, I, I was like, um, I want to can I do a quick cameo in the film. He's like, yeah. I go, can I do this character? He's like, well, he's wearing a mask. I go, yeah, but he takes it off. So in the film, guys, is um, there's a scene at Day of the Dead festival at a cemetery. Filmed in Boyle Heights for local people here, Evergreen Cemetery. There's a man in a skull mask, paper mache skull mask, and a, a poncho painted with skeleton body on it. Uh, El Muerto, Diego, uh, Diego Wilmer, walks into the cemetery in full costume and runs into this man in a mask. And it, the guy takes the mask off and ta da, it's me. In the history of cam creator cameos, that one stands out because. It's, I think it's the only time I've seen a creator cameo where the guy's masked and, in, you know, because you're going to remember the guy takes the mask off. So I thought that was in retrospect. Oh, yeah, that was a good idea picking that character. Plus, I wanted a scene with Wilmer. I didn't want to be the background guy or, you know, like a scene that doesn't have anything to do with the character. Um, like, um, I mean, Stan Lee pretty much gets right in, right up there with the actors. But I remember the the, the Crow movie. A lot of people don't know this. James O'Barr has a cameo in it, but there's a scene where uh, the policeman's talking to the crow and the background, the city's burning. There's a guy comes out of one of the bombed out stores stealing the TV. That's that's James O'Barr. So I, I, I don't want any of that stuff. I'm not coming out of the trash or stealing stuff. I want a, a cool scene with a mask in a costume with my character, with, with Wilmer. So, and I had a couple of lines I had to recite with him. Um... Yeah, I'm not a real, I'm not a trained actor, folks. So that was that was testing me, but it was a fantastic experience, you know. How amazing is it though to to appear on screen in a movie, you know, with a known actor, and he's playing your character, and you're face to face with him, and you're seeing him in the flesh, right in front of you, jumping right out the page. Like that's got to be like one of the greatest moments of your life you know what i mean it has to be because that's just like not many people can 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 say that period you know yeah he's in full cost that's the thing you know i want him as el muerto face paint black suit and yeah and it, 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 i love that it's right there in the heart of boyle heights um in a cemetery yeah it's it really is ideal and i look i do look back with just complete gratitude and like wow what a great fantastic thing that you know the way it all worked out um um you know i remember the day uh where we did our, our scene was at night so we were filming that cemetery all day there was tons of stuff to film and then around six o'clock i don't know i forgot what time i'm walking around then i hear the, there's all the pas or assistant directors on set with my with the uh, walkie talkies and then i hear the like <laughs> okay uh we need javier over to makeup then i got then I got nervous, like, oh, shoot, we got to film it. I mean, it's not just waiting for it to happen. So I went to the trailer, and they, they're doing makeup on me. And I got a little Hollywood. I go, oh, can I get a haircut? <laughs> hey, it's paid for by the producer, right? Maybe I'll take advantage. Just I got a little trim. Uh, I got the makeup. Um, just regular face makeup. I mean, I didn't have the white skull face. Um, and then I got... You know, my costume, just a black shirt, black pants, and then that poncho. It's a black poncho, which they made. They painted a skeleton body on it. The the mask, I made it. My friend Steve Guerra helped me make it because um, I haven't done paper mache since I was a kid. So I went to his house one night, and I go, Steve, I need a skull face. He goes, okay, we'll make it out of paper mache. So I painted the, the, the face on it, the, the eyes and the mouth. So I still have that. Like, I have... Yeah, because I, I brought it to the set. Like, it was my mask when you think about it. Again, I don't know if you could do that in the big film. They, they would do everything and, you know, whatever. So the, there's advantages to a big film, obviously, because I would have had more money. More people would have seen it and all that stuff, of course. But you know what? The fact that I got to work on the film from day one to day, the, the last shoot plus the promotion after, which maybe we can talk about if we have time. But So, yeah. I was involved with that film all the way through, like intimately, because uh, at one point, 
He's like, yeah, Javier, you know, when it comes down to it, once the film's done, everyone leads and goes on to other stuff. But it, really, you, me, and Brian, it's our film. Like, we, we, we got to put it to, you know. Um, so, again, it's, like, astounding for me to be working on a film that I'm not connected to the film industry. I got no family members. You know, no one got me in the film business. I never went to film school. Uh, I'm just a cartoonist who loves comics, and they made a film out of uh, my comic. So, great experience. Where is the actual El Muerto costume? Where is that? Is that where does that does that still exist? Does someone have that, or where is that? Yeah, no, good question. Yeah, because they probably made about four or five, right? They always have to have extra. Yeah, yeah, because you can't just have one because if it rips, you know, you're wasting time on a set if you're waiting. So yeah, you got to have a couple of made. I imagine Wilmer may have taken one or got gotten one, taken one. He stole it. Uh, the but the producer would have everything, whatever. Yeah, and it, yeah. I, I should have one. I should have got one. I should be like Batman, where I have the I have it in a in a case, right, in my mortal cave. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. No one's ever asked me about the, the the suit. Where's the suit at? If there's four or five of them, you definitely should have one, or maybe reach out to the producer. And be like, hey, you still have one of those one of those costumes, one of the hero costumes? Is that that would be great to display. Um, and it, I mean, yeah, I mean, seriously, we're coming on 25 year anniversary, right? I mean, how cool would that be to like at the next, uh, uh, comics expo of yours, which you're going to dive into right now. Imagine having a, that on display there. Like this was one of the costumes from the movie. Yeah, no, no, that's a, that's a good point. I, I got my mask. I got my, and I got the poncho. Yeah. Wilmer's suit and my suit. Yeah, you're right. I did have an El Muerto suit made up a few years before the movie. Uh, because yeah, I was doing a lot of shows, conventions. I go, well, let me get a let me get somebody to dress up as the character. Because like you're saying, it's such a simple suit. You know, it's not a skin tight suit, so it's not like it's gonna be revealing. It's like, no, just get a, someone who can fit in that, you know, uh mariachi suit and the white makeup. So yeah, I would have I think I had maybe two or three friends over like a year or two, uh just show up at my show and be um what do you call them? Booth babes, the women. So like this is a, a Alberto model guy, whatever. Um <laughs> so it, it's funny. One of one of the guys who dressed up for me at a show, one or two shows, I got him a little uh, what, an extra scene in a Muerto film. So yeah, there's a scene where he's in, it's when the car crashes. Um, it's during the day. It's outside the the car crashes and El Muerto comes and resurrects the guy. While the guy in the next time you watch the film, there's a young guy. He's got a goatee, I think a a blue beanie and a blue jacket. So it's kind of a multiverse of muertos. Like, wow, there's two muertos in that scene. So there's a little tidbit. I don't think I've shared that much ever in interviews. You're the co-founder of the Latino Comics Expo. Let's let's uh, let's talk about that. And that's that's an amazing convention that you do. That gives a lot of opportunity to the Latino community. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, not busy enough doing comics and teaching and making a movie here and there. Um, yeah, in 2011. Um, I co-founded the Latino Comics Expo with my friend Ricardo Padilla. Uh, I met him through just doing comic shows in San Francisco Bay Area. He would just come looking. He was a comic fan, and he was always interested in Latino creators, and he'd bring his kids. And I've seen his kids grow from being kids to professional adults working in you know the legal world. And so one day where I was doing a show in San Francisco, and then we were talking afterwards, and he was lamenting something going on in there, something they, they, they weren't going to... The plans fell through for some like Mexican museum in the city, something like that. And he was all bummed out. You know, he loves art, all types of art, and he loves his culture. And I go, well, I can't do anything about that. But I go, I don't know, maybe we can do our own little thing. Like, uh, And I made up the word. I literally made it up on the street there. I go, maybe we'll do a Latino comics expo. Again, like the, like the costume, go with the simplest name. Just go, yeah, on point. It, that's all you need, Latino comics expo. He goes, what? he goes, what's that? I go, well, there'd be a little show, a little convention where we have Latino comic creators selling their comics, like me and the, the other friends that I knew at that point, 2011. I'd already been around, um, I don't know how many years, my mass terrible, 10 years, whatever. Um, so, yeah. So he lived in San Francisco. I lived in Los Angeles. So I go, well, you handle it. Do me a favor. Maybe we'll go... And, Maybe we'll end up at American Legion Hall, you know, just a regular, I don't say run down, but, you know, just a real small time little thing. 
But just for the heck of it, since you live in San Francisco, Ricardo, why don't you go ask that Cartoon Art Museum, that real beautiful, high-end, you know, niche uh, museum dedicated to comics and newspaper strips. Ask them first, and they'll probably say no, and then go look for an American Legion Hall or whatever. We'll do it out in the park. I don't know. We'll figure something out. So I go home back to L.A., and then, I don't know, a month or so later, I get a call by Ricardo. Hey, they said yes. I'm like, who said yes? I already forgot all this stuff. It was Cartoon Art Museum. They said yes. They they would love to host us for Latino Comic Act. And I'm like, oh, my, holy crap. We got to do this now, I guess. So, yeah, we, uh, you know, he found out their space requirements. And, okay, they can fit a couple of tables. We can get 12 artists. This is our first show, so I thought that was, I was hoping I could get 12. But, yeah, we got 12 artists that weekend. Uh, I think it was in May, 2011, I think May. Uh, some of them were local area, some of them were from L.A., but we all got there. And then, yeah, so that first weekend, it was the first Latino Comics Expo, but it was also the first time that I know of that an audience, mostly Latino uh, fans, that an audience could walk in the door and just find nothing but Latino creators, Latinas, zines, graphic novels, political comment, whatever. And they were amazed. We were amazed, you know, as the as the exhibitors. And yeah, it's grown from there since. As you know, we moved we moved it from Cartoon Art Museum because we outgrew it. Like we got more tables the next year. And then it was like, hey guys, we love you guys. The museum we're turning away artists though. We're not even no they and they understood, hey guys, we're honored to have been your first museum for three years. Go out and go over it as big as you got to get. So eventually we decided, well, you know what? L.A. is the ground zero, I think, for Latino pop culture in the world, maybe, or at least outside of Mexico. So, and I live here in L.A., so, yeah, let's find an L.A. place. So we found the cart- um, the Museum of Latin American Art, MOLA, in Long Beach for several years now. And you walk in there, yeah, it's not 12 tables, it's... 50, 60 tables, and sometimes there's two artists per table. So, yeah, it could be over 100 creators when you come to one of our expos. Um, so, yeah, it's been a phenomenal 11 years now, I think. Congratulations. That's that's so many um, talented individuals have become inspired just by going to that show. I mean, there's people that I, I'm pretty positive went there and were so motivated leaving there. Sometimes in, in areas where people live, like – you don't have anyone to really look up to or see that someone's doing something. But if you could see outward other places in the world, there's people like you or people that are doing things that you want to do and that they're doing, they're making it possible. It inspires you and motivates you to pursue those passions and make those things reality. So, you know, big up, big ups to you and doing a show like this, because it's definitely inspired a lot of individuals who now it's become their careers. Or for some people, it's, it's a, it's the hobby that keeps them sane, you know what I mean? Or it makes yeah. them happy. They might have some other job, but they like to do the art because it's really what they love to do. That's their like um, pastime, you know? So it's a beautiful thing. It really is. Javier, we're going to uh, round out here with some final questions. I call this ordinary questions with extraordinary individuals. First one is, what is your favorite color? Every day could be a different answer. I could say black. I could say white. I could say blue. Uh, today I'm gonna say pink. I love adding pink on my artwork sometimes because it's like, man, it's such a bright, different color, you know. So, what is your favorite artist or band of all time? Music. I gotta say the Smiths. There's maybe three or four other ones, or five or ten, but yeah, the default is uh, the Smiths. You know, I won't get into all the song titles, but if you go back to a lot of the early Smiths, and I was listening to this stuff in the '80s. I, li- I listen to the music now and like, man, I can already see some of the threads or the roots for El Muerto and Diego coming from the, some of the Smith songs and, and, and other things too. Um, but yeah, to me, it's undeniable. So, what is your favorite movie of all time? It could, it could, it, it, it fluctuates between Godfather, Godfather Two, and The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. I mean, you know, the, you know, depending on the day of the week. Um, so I can't just give you one, but. Those three are just way up there. And then there's another 10 and then another 50. But it's like really those three. Pro- probably overall, the good, the bad, the ugly. 
Can you believe I've never seen that movie? I need to watch that movie. Dude. That's one of those movies where it's like, I should have seen it a long time ago and I haven't. So I'm going to watch that movie. Yeah, but watch it. The good thing is you get to watch it now, brand new with fresh eyes. What is your favorite snack or dessert of all time? Um, I can't ever pass by a slice of pizza if it's, uh, well, not if it's on the floor in the street, but yeah, it's nothing like a nice slice of pizza. Pepperoni in a row, man. That's what I was going to say. What are the toppings? What do you pick on your pizza? I go for the simple. You know what? Pepperoni for sure and uh, maybe uh, uh, Canadian bacon, whatever they call it. Man, I I, uh, I picked the controversial pineapple, believe it or not. <laughs> I go against the grain. <laughs> There's always the one person in the group that wants pineapple on it, yeah. One place you have not traveled to yet that you still want to visit? Um... I got to get to the Mexican pyramids, but uh, Japan is always on my mind. Japan, go to Japan finally. That'd be a big uh, check off my list. What would you look forward to seeing there the most? Yeah, I'm going to sound like the, you know, on a, a, a taku. Um, I'd like to go to, um, I mean, there's so much culture and history there, which I'd check out, but I want to go to the, uh, was it the Mandaraki? It's like this huge, like the, yeah, it's a huge center of this, these big stores, five stores. I think one building is like manga, five stories, and like another building, five stories of toys, another. You know what I mean? It's like wow, that's just nuts. My answer is the same as yours, and 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 literally, they asked what like one of the things that I'd want to go do there, and it's literally your answer too. I want to go see that just because that district, like it's just, I mean, you know, what can I say? I like comic books and art and collectibles, so like I'm gonna want to see that, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's it's not a it's not a big stretch for asking a comic person. Yeah, what would they like to do in Japan? What is your favorite franchise or nostalgic property of all time? Nostalgic, okay, nostalgic. To me, that's the key word. Uh, I would say Planet of the Apes, because I grew up as a kid when they would because there was five original films, so they'd be able to show them on the week on the local TV show like Planet of the Apes week, so Monday through Friday. So and then there was a TV show at the time, a live action TV show when I was a kid. I had these uh, eight-inch Mego figures with the fabric clothes on them. Yeah. Uh, and then there was a cartoon in the 70s. And then the Tim Burton film in the 90s, whenever 2000. And then the, the three recent Apes movies by, I think, Matt Reeves. I think they're excellent. Like, I always get tired of reboots and all that, you know, but it's a different version of it because they're actual apes. In the, in the original ones, they were humanoid apes right there wearing clothes and you know in the new ones it's no literally apes and then they're they're evolving but they never get to the point where they're wearing clothes i think some of them talk are able to talk um but so yeah but the more primitive but yet so that's why i like it like no you, it's it's a different series although it's a very similar world or concept but it's different enough where it's its own thing yet it still ties into the like what you call them, franchise this is so weird. I've seen like all of them except for like the first one. It's so weird. But I need to like, I went like completely, I went ape shit backwards, you know? <laughs> yeah. So like, I need to like go watch. That'd be like watching all the Star Wars movies and like never seeing Star Wars, you know? Like the actual just plain Star Wars. Yeah. Final question. If you could offer one last bit of advice to anyone out there trying to pursue their passions, what would it be, Javier? Well, it's just the, the what they call the cliche idea. I mean, you want to do it, then do it. Don't let anyone, including yourself, uh, tell you otherwise. Because um, you don't want to regret it later. Five years, 10 years, 30 years later, like, oh, I should have done this, whatever it is. Whatever this is. Um, yeah, do it. You know, despite what people will tell you, you know, oh, you're wasting your time or, oh, there's no market for that or whatever it is. Um if you feel you want to do it, there's so many reasons why you feel that, whatever it is. Um, and if it's a real burning thing in you, you really should scratch that itch, as they say, right? But don't be your worst enemy because that, that you are going to be your worst enemy. Believe me, it happens all. Even today, um, I'm talking about 24 years later, I, I know I still have little doubts or, you know, you look you look what's out there and it's like, you compare yourself to the other people, the other comics, which is you shouldn't do that. And I still, I still, that still comes across me sometimes. Other times, I just sitting back, happy to 
hey, I got a new book done. Hey, I got the new book back from the printer. Hey, I'm at this convention selling my books. Yeah, there's more positive feelings than the self-doubt. But the self-doubts, I think, are good because they make you take stock of what you're doing. And then you remember why you're doing it. You know, and, and then you're glad that you didn't stop. You know, you're glad you didn't listen to the negative you back before you started. So, um, but yeah, please out there. I mean, I know all your guests on here. You're always talking about, yeah, uh, the passion you have. So you have passions wherever you are listening, whatever you want to do. Skateboarding, dancing, writing poetry, making comics. Do it and do it and put it out there. Because I'm sure a lot of them are doing it at home and they write it and they put it in a drawer. But yeah, you probably want people to hear it or see it or see you do something. So please go do that. Do your best job you can and um, do it for your reasons, whatever your reasons are. I mean, if you want to be famous or you want a movie deal, I mean, okay, fine. You can do that. Try it. Um, but then if you don't get the movie deal, then you're going to feel that you didn't succeed. But if you know, if you're like, hey, I just wanted to put my comics out in the world and sell them and you know get people interested, then like for me, everything else was extra. The movie, like, wow, that was great. Uh, creating the expo, those I never thought about that in 98. So pursue your passion. That's what the show's about. That's that's how I put it sometimes to a lot of people. As I, I like to say that, like, look, you're you're not. You got to think you're doing it because you love to do it, right? So at the end of the day, if you put it out, you're a winner. You won already because you put it out. Like, it don't even. It doesn't even matter what the reception is, or if it's like, uh, you know, a Billboard chart hit or whatever, or a, a New York Times bestseller or anything. You, you don't want to regret, regret not having done it or put it out because later on when you're, you know, 80, 90 years old and you look back, it's not about if you won awards or did this or that. It's more like, did I do the thing? You want to look back and be like, oh, look, here's this book I made. It doesn't matter if it sold a million copies. or not. It's just like, look, here's this book I made. And like that, that milestone and that portion, that memory and that mindset that you had at that point in time is saved kind of like almost like a time capsule and you put it out there and it exists and that's you and your youth or at least the youngest you were ever going to be whatever that age could be or was and you put it out at that moment and now it exists there and you will regret not having it out there for the rest of your life no no it's totally true i mean i like looking at it i get like getting a stack of my books over the 24 years and it's just like wow i did this when i was you know 30 i did this when i was 35 you know whatever it is um and they pick up another one, and it's like you said, like, you know, these are all the bricks I laid on my road. And I, I got hopefully another bunch more bricks to put in front of me till the sunset. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not a digital comic guy, so I don't know if you get the same feeling. No offense to anybody, but, yeah, holding your printed comics in your hand, looking at the older ones and seeing the art changes over the years. And then the memories, like, oh, man, I remember debuting this at this show, or I remember meeting this famous artist because they saw my, whatever it is. There's so many memories that you're going to get from whatever you do. So whatever your goal is, like Ruben mentioned, top 40 hit or whatever, or you just want to publish your book, like, that's your goal. But you don't have no idea what is going to come from all that. Just the traveling you're going to do, the experiences, the people you meet. You know, those young people that, wow, you know, I want to do comics too, or whatever it is. Like, and that, that's what I didn't know in the beginning. I, I had no idea of all these other many millions of experiences I've had um, because I did what I want to do, what I wanted to do. So, so Javier, any last words? Anything you want to plug here before we sign out? I'm working on the next graphic novel, uh, number two, um, Casa del Diablo, where El Muerto is. Um, in the first book, Days of the Dead, he's uh, he was a Mexicali at some uh, circus yeah. freak show. He got trapped in there. So the second book takes place literally right after that. At the end of the first book, he gets in that little Volkswagen. So yeah, awesome. now he's gonna drive from. You'll love this because you're a border you're a border kid. <laughs> he's gonna drive from Mexicali to Tijuana because he wants to get to Tijuana because he's looking for a curandero who can he hopes can help him with yeah. this curse he has. Yeah. Halfway between Mexicali and Tijuana, there's this winding road called La, uh, La Rumerosa, I yeah. think. Yeah, uh -huh. I've been on it. Exactly. Diego gets halfway up there. He finds this woman. Her car is wrecked. Someone stole her infant baby. 
So he helps her and they find this uh, hitherto unknown giant hacienda way at the top of the mountain that yeah. shouldn't be there. Yeah. Ta -da! So, so there's that story. And then the, the next, the third book, he actually finally gets to Tijuana. Uh -huh. So the first three books are going to be my border tales where he's wonderful right there in the northern part of Mexico along the U.S. borders. So yeah. For all you border folks out there. Yeah. Border Tales is a good name, actually. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, wonderful. That is awesome. And and uh, before we sign up, too, everyone listening, it's going to be the... We're coming on, like you said, the 25th year anniversary of El Muerto. So that's going to be something year. exciting next year. Yeah. So stay on the lookout the for that. Imperial, I hope I put the Imperial Valley Entertainment Convention on my... Uh, yeah. Playlist for next year. Oh, you got it. You are always invited. You're always invited. And 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 yeah, actually we we had spoken about this, but for anyone listening, here's a little sneak peek of info, but Javier's going to do the cover for next uh our next Imperial Valley Entertainment Convention exclusive. So he's going to be the honorary cover artist for that. So you can look forward to that. So everyone that's collecting, I know there's some people that collect those every year they come out since the first year it came out. And so right. this will be book number 4 because obviously COVID made us miss Right. two or three three it made yeah. us miss three by the time this one hits so you'll be able to continue the uh, exclusive book collection this will be the fourth one and uh really honored to have you doing the cover for this one javier and um yeah what's what's your social media javier so you could plug it in people can follow you check out your stuff there yeah yeah i always recommend uh instagram uh javier los comics we'll have that up here on the screen for you guys um you can go to havzilla.com uh, that's my, it's a blog where I have, I don't post as often because I'm always on social network, but on the blog is all the links for all my, I got a YouTube channel I do, those comics TV, uh, merch, uh, yeah. yeah, books, merch. I have a link, I have a link to my store. Yeah. Uh, it's a store envy. So yeah, people can find those links at com or even on my Instagram on my profile page. Um, and then you can find my books on Amazon, there we uh, go. the Alberto the graphic novel Days of the Dead is up there. El Muerto Origins is up there and a couple other ones. So, um, yeah, thanks for having me on the show, Ruben. Uh, An honor to have you. Have talking you. To you. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you for being on the show. Everyone listening, I hope you enjoyed this. It's been a treat. Uh, and I hope you all pursue your passions. Uh, like Javier said, don't, you know, you're your worst enemy. Get past yourself. Make it happen. Mm -hmm. Just do it. Just do the thing you want to do. All right, folks? So, until next time, signing out here. Everybody, have a great week.